Hello everyone and welcome to Science Gallery Dublin. Um, as part of our Soundcheck events programme, we're delighted to welcome Robin Par uh, Parmer here today to talk to us about sound and listening through the lens of biology and perce perception. So Robin is, has studied a variety of subjects including noise, post-punk music, um, hypermodernism, as well as the history of recording. So I'm sure tonight is going to have cover a wide range of topics. Um, after the talk, there'll be time for a short Q&A. Uh, so enjoy the event, and if you want to check out our website for any upcoming events, you're more than welcome to. So, Robin. Thank you. There we are. I have to say, it's very good to be here at the Science Gallery and to have enjoyed uh, the Soundcheck exhibition, which I've, I've seen a couple times now. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the surprising world of sound and listening, and there's an awful lot to talk about, so this is going to just be a survey of sorts, but I'm going to highlight a few interesting things along the way, these things that I think are, are interesting. Um, and we're basically going to look at these topics, so you'll see it's going to be just a quick survey. First of all, what is sound? Because most of us actually may not know what sound actually is. Of course, there's different definitions of that, but we're going to look at it through the lens of physics. How do we hear sound, which is the realm of biology and, and the functioning of organs like the ear? How do we perceive sound, which is a different thing again? The information we get from the ear is not actually how we perceive sound. I'm going to spend some time on that when we get to that section. That's the realm of psychology. You could call it phenomenology if you're into philosophy. It also gets into aesthetics. And finally, a very short extra section, I suppose, on how do instruments work, which takes us back to physics. And that's because of the exhibition we have here uh, this summer. Um, a lot of the instruments out there you might have a new perspective on, or a slightly new vocabulary for at the end of this talk, which will be about 45 minutes. So I'm Robin Palmer, not Robert Palmer, uh, although I am addicted to love. Um, I first studied physics and then had professional training as an audio engineer. And then more recently in Ireland, I've had a further degree in music technology. And I call myself a sound artist in actual fact. Um, sorry, I won't go into objectives. Just I call myself a sound artist because I'm a composer who works without conventional instruments. I design sound installations and experiences. And I'm also a researcher. Um, and some of the areas of research were mentioned in the introduction. So that's who I am. I'm an occasional lecturer at the University of Limerick. And I have a website, which is my name. So if you can remember my name, you can remember where to find me. And I do welcome email. Uh, correspondence uh, subsequent to this, because the Q&A sec section probably won't be long enough for us to get through stuff. So I want to enhance your perception of sound through developing a vocabulary for sonic phenomena to learn what sound is and how it functions, and along the way, some misunderstandings, some myths, some paradoxes even. So the first section, what is sound? I'll start with a nice um, illustration. So. What we have there is just a simple animation that representing a constant energy source that's radiating out in all directions. And what we have is a regular pattern of disturbances in the air. Let's call it air for now. It could be in water, but let's say that's in air. And you see that it's a, it's a, it's a compression pattern of denser regions and less dense regions. And that's all sound is from a physical standpoint. Sound is a mechanical disturbance in a medium propagating through a sequence of compressions and rarefactions. That's actually all it is, which may not seem that interesting or it may surprise you depending on your perspective you came in the room with. So in order to create that disturbance, some sort of energy had to be put into the system. Um, and in air, we talk about a change in pressure. So to represent this, we have, um, well, first of all, we have a longitudinal wave. There's many different sorts of waves we can have. And I'm not going to show you any equations today. You'll be happy to hear. Although it makes it a lot harder for me to explain the physics, because without equations, physics collapses uh, into, into wish fulfillment, I think. But 
a longitudinal wave is one where the compressions and rarefactions are happening in the direction the wave is moving. So it's different from, say, if you pluck a guitar string, because there the string is vibrating at right angles to the string. But in the air and in other media like that, in anything where we have sound, uh, it's a longitudinal wave. And how do we represent that? Well, typically, uh, in first-year physics or maths class, people draw a sine wave and say that this is sound. So I, the point I want to make is this is not sound. This is a representation of one aspect of sound. We often confuse a representation with the thing itself. This is actually a philosophical problem. It's, a, it's, a, it's an error that people make. So a sine wave, as shown here, represents the simplest sort of harmonic motion, the simplest possible sort of sound, and uh, I'll have you listen to some in a few minutes, some examples of sine waves. But this represents pressure changing over time. Okay, I've already said this. A sound is not a sine wave. It only represents certain properties of a sound wave, and to show that, we'll go to another illustration. In this case, we have compressions and rarefactions of air in a tube that's open on one end, much like many musical instruments might be, or, the, um, or uh, an organ, the, the tubes of an organ and so on. So it's open on one end there on the left. I believe it's your left. It is your left. I have to turn around. Below it are two different representations, both of which are sine waves. The representation in black, which I know you can't read the text, that shows the displacement of a molecule or atom of air. So every, every atom, um, if, let's say it's pure oxygen, so it's atoms. Every atom is being displaced left or right from its resting position as this disturbance sweeps through it. The red curve represents what I showed you a moment ago, pressure change over time. It's also a sine wave. So even in this one example, Sine waves can be used to represent two different things. So I've belabored that point because it's actually a really big point. We often confuse, in digital audio, people confuse those pictures of staircase digital sampling with digital sound. It's not. It's just a representation of one aspect of it. Okay. So the primary properties of sound we need to look at, and there are four of them, wavelength, frequency, amplitude, and the speed. I'm going to go through them briefly. The wavelength of a wave is the distance between the peaks or between the troughs or the zero points. It doesn't matter, but it's just how long it takes in space. So you can measure it in meters, how long it takes for the wave to repeat. And we use a Greek letter lambda to represent that typically. The frequency is how often the wave cycles. So it's actually the inverse of the wavelength, but we use it more often and we measure frequency in cycles per second in the old style, or we call it a hertz in the metric system, uh, after Heinrich Hertz, who was a physicist who studied electromagnetic waves. So frequency, when we talk about frequencies, it's nice to talk about how we hear frequencies. And I wonder how readable, that's a big screen. You can probably read those animal names off there, can you? Quite clearly, good, good. So. So there's two scales across the top. The first one is, is um, actually a, 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 an exponential scale in powers of 10, which is how scientists would tend to do things. And below that, it's the actual number of hertz. So the, the uh, sort of nice green bar representing human hearing goes from 20 hertz to 18,000 hertz, 18 kilohertz. And anything below our hearing, we call infrasound. Anything with a frequency above what we can hear, we call ultrasound. So those two terms are just defined in terms of our hearing. We're very egocentric about scientific terms sometimes. And the little red box I put above us, that's medical ultrasound. So if you go to have any soft tissue scans or if you happen to be uh, expecting a child, you might go for an ultrasound, and that is in a 5 to 10 megahertz uh, frequency. But it's still the same property. An ultrasound is actually just making parts of your flesh become more and less dense as it goes through your body, and, and which is perhaps slightly more interesting to think about than when it's going through air. Okay, so we've got other animals. Um, 
it's kind of it's kind of a myth. You know, people say, "Wow, the do dogs hear really high frequencies. They hear much better than us." And those, you know, those porpoises and so on. It's kind of a myth that we have poor hearing in, in this aspect. We have very typical hearing. Uh, an elephant can hear down to 17 hertz, a little bit in the infrasound region, um, but it doesn't extend as high as we do. Dogs can hear higher frequencies than we can, but they can't hear, you know, the baseline of a techno track. Um, so. Different animals have different hearing. Some are very peculiar, like bats, like the brown bat, pictured in, uh, um, picture represented in orange, has only a very high frequency level of hearing. And some of the animals that live in the water do much better because sound travels differently in water. That's part of the reason, which I'll briefly mention in a moment. So there we go, a bunch of animals and their hearing ranges. And you can see that we're quite typical, actually. So I've already said this. Um, yes, and I'm going to go straight on to a listening exercise. Listening exercise. So I'm going to play for you a sound for a little while, or some sounds, and you can try and imagine what they are. It's, a sound, it's an actual sound recording. It's not generated or algorithmic composition or anything like that. Okay, I'll actually stop it halfway through. So, any, any guesses? Anyone know what we're listening to? Dolphins? Any other guesses? Sound like dolphins? Did it sound like anything else? Bats. Sorry? Bats. bats? It could be bats, but actually it was dolphins. <laughs> uh, very good. It was these guys. It was bottlenose dolphins, which these are, uh, recorded in the Red Sea. Um, Dolphins emit those you know, distinctive clicks and buzzes using specialized organs in their forehead uh, in order to echolocate prey and other animals and each other. As we well know, we know all that because they're so cool and we love them. Um, the other sound that was heard there in the background, the sort of the chattering, constant sort of white noise sound, is prawns or shrimp. The loudest animal in the ocean is a shrimp which you may not have known. They are louder than whales. Now, some of the whale song actually transmits further because they use uh, lower frequencies. But the, 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 the species of shrimp is actually the loudest creature in the ocean. And even when they're not super loud, they're always there in those situations. So people that do um, hydrophone recordings, as that was, get lots of uh, shrimp sounds. It's their version of the wind that we try to avoid in, in recordings. So OK, so that's frequency. Amplitude. Amplitude is just the pressure change. So amplitude is the y-axis here on our uh, sine curve again. And we hear over an enormous range of pressures. Okay? Even if we're not spectacular when it comes to frequency, we might just be typical. We are quite spectacular here. We hear f over a range of 10 micropascals to 60 pascals. Now, pascal is just a unit of pressure named after another dude. Blaise Pascal, actually, some sort of genius, some sort of French genius who invented the mechanical calculator, which actually a couple of the devices out there are sort of based on. Um, anyway, 10 micropascals to 60 pascals. A micro is one millionth. So that's a range of six million in pressure that we hear uh, quite easily. Now, in order to express these enormous numbers, I'm not going to show you the equation, <laughs> but we, we compare the pressure to a baseline pressure, sort of a standard number that we invent, which is actually 20 micropascals, and we take that ratio and take a logarithm of it in order to express large numbers as smaller, more meaningful numbers. There, and the result, after we multiply it by 10 or 20, depending on what we're doing, is a decibel. So when we talk about decibels, we're talking about a ratio of pressures, so the pressure we're wanting to measure over a standard pressure, then you take the logarithm of it and you end up with a scale sort of like this. 
where every six decibels is a doubling of sound pressure level on a scale of zero to 194, interestingly. And so here are some typical sounds and how loud they are over that scale. And I want to talk about like, a, the quiet end of the scale and the loud end of the scale. So I'll ask you another question, since that worked pretty well. People answered. Um, has anyone ever heard a pin drop? And I don't mean you put a microphone on it and you amplified it. I mean, have you actually heard with your naked ear a pin drop? Yes? Anyone else? Yes? Yes? OK, right. So it fell on some sort of substance that managed to actually resonate a little bit or amplify the sound a little bit. But you managed to as well? In what, what circumstance? Just on the floor, OK. And over here as well, just? Yeah, like the safety pin, or like you're trying to put it on and you don't. OK, yeah, OK. A safety pin is, yeah, I should have specified the type of pin. I got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this would be like a, I mean, you can, you would have to be in a very quiet environment, and things would just have to be perfect to hear 20 decibels. Um, yeah, it, it would be pretty hard. Or you would sit in a room like this. Okay, this is Orfield Labs in Minneapolis, and it's 99.99% sound absorbent. So there is no echo or reverberation or any other sound in that room other than what's generated. It's an anechoic chamber, as we call it, anechoic, not echo. And it's used for equipment testing and also psychoacoustic hearing testing. And I need to update this picture because um, it's no longer the world's quietest room, but... Um, um, as of 2015, Microsoft has the quietest room in the world, much quieter than that room. But sticking with quiet, can we have a sound quieter than zero decibels is an interesting question. And the answer comes from the fact that, that our SPL, our sound pressure level, is measured against a baseline, against 20 micropascals. I mentioned that in passing. So yes, we can have a sound less than zero if it's less pressure than 20 micropascals. And in fact, I also had on a slide that we can hear down to 10. So we can actually hear negative decibels. So the scale is a bit whacked, really. They should readjust it, but they never did. So um, that anechoic chamber is at minus 9 decibels. And the Microsoft Labs is at minus 20, which is I don't know. That, I, I've, if you ever have a chance to go into an anechoic chamber, you should. Um, there's even occasions where concerts are done. There's even music that's composed specifically for anechoic chambers. I missed by one day the chance to hear a concert uh, when I was visiting in Canada in, in an anechoic chamber. And I, was, I read it in the newspaper. I was like, oh, it happened yesterday. Um, I was really upset. But if you ever get a chance, do. OK, on the other end, loudness. How loud is loud? Well, the most interesting thing there is a rock concert, I'd say. Chainsaws aren't that interesting. But a rock concert at three meters from the speakers is, on this table, put it 120 decibels. Obviously, that's an approximation. The loudest rock band um, in history, it, when I was young, um, was The Who. And they did a gig in London in 1976, and they played at 126 decibels. And it was like, wow, that's something expletive loud, which I almost said. I, I'm, I'm being broadcast here, so I have to be careful. But, but um, 20 years later, the Electronica band that no one remembers, Left Field. Does anyone remember Left Field? Someone. They actually caused plaster to fall from the ceiling of Brixton Academy when they played not at 120 or 126, but apparently at 137 decibels. And I've been at some loud gigs, but I would not, for the sake of my hearing, want to have been at that gig. But on this scale, it goes up to this mysterious number 194. So I could ask, can we have a sound louder than 194 decibels? Is there a limit to how loud sound can get? And the answer here is yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. The answer is no. We cannot have a sound louder than 194. And the reason is, again, 
the definition of what sound is. Sound is a mechanical disturbance, and at this point in time, we're talking about air, um, like rock gigs tend to occur in air, although concerts are done underwater as well, but the Who never played underwater. Uh, so in air, you have an air pressure of around 101 kilopascals is our standard air pressure. So the, if, if all sound is is a disturbance in the, in the pressure from zero up to the maximum, the maximum it can ever be is 101 point something. And if you put that into the equation, you get out 194 decibels. So you actually can't have a sound louder than what the air pressure will support. If you tried to, and we'll have an example in a minute that I'll play for you, what would happen is clipping. You'd, the sound would actually be clipped in the air itself and distorted. It would be like mechanical clipping, um, which might interest some of you. So, so here's an image. Um, this is actually a lithograph t made from a photo taken in May of 1883 of Krakatoa. Krakatoa is a volcanic island in Indonesia. It's actually right between Java and Sumatra. And um, in 1883, it entered this ferocious cycle of activity. And on August the 27th at 10.02, it exploded. So that image you just saw was actually made in May, so several months before. So this had been erupting like a crazy thing for months. And people were there studying it and so on. And some of them didn't do so well. Because when the sound went off, it was heard 4,800 kilometers away. Okay, that's the other side of an ocean. Um, the sound wave circled the globe more than three times. So if you were at one, like say you were in Dublin, you would actually have heard it six or seven times because it would have gone both ways around the globe, right? Through the air. So you would have heard it six or seven times. Now, you may not have actually heard it with the ears, but instruments could measure it that number of times. Anyone within 20 kilometers of Krakatoa would have been deafened instantly and perhaps for life. And that happened. And a lot of people lost their lives, mostly through tsunamis and so on. So I'm going to play you that. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to play you that. I will play you if I can possibly. See, now, now my tiny little fly -like cursor has to do that. It's coming. So now you know what to say when a volcano <laughs> erupts. That's, that's exactly what you should say. So, so this is a really minor eruption, uh, uh, you know, comparatively speaking. But I hope you saw there through the air the, the shock wave going through the air. It's quite something. This is some random video I found on, on YouTube, which is how I do most of my research. Um, <laughs> and it was made in 2014. So... This leads me to think about the speed of sound when I, when I see that shock wave traveling through the air, and that's the next property that I need to look at. So the speed of sound varies in different media. So it's actually slowest in a gas like air. In air, at 20 degrees or whatever, it's 332 meters per second it travels. Fairly slowly, these, these disturbances travel. Um, and uh, this would depend on the temperature of the air, but really not really much else. Uh, in a liquid, uh, such as water, it travels at around 1,450 meters per second, so a lot faster. And you know this, actually, if you've been at the swimming pool, and you, you can do interesting tests. Uh, and there are concerts for swimming pools that occur in the UK every year, actually, uh, where, where music is specially made for swimming pools, with speakers both underwater and above the surface. Anyway, that's kind of an aside. But, and in a solid, such as, say, a specimen of steel, it could be 5,000 meters per second. And this depends on many factors. In a solid, it depends on how compressible the solid is, its density, 
its elasticity and other very technical things that civil engineers know more about than I do. But the main point there is, is the speed at which, at which uh, sound moves. So you can figure out how far the boat was from the volcano, whoops, yeah, just by timing it, just by visually seeing when the blast went off. And it's actually 12.8 seconds you waited to hear the sound. So if you multiply by 332, uh, you get the distance, which is four and a quarter kilometers. So they're over four kilometers away, and just as well. Uh, you don't want to be too close when that happens because it could rupture your eardrum. Um, and um, for this sort of reason here, sound propagates. Again, if you imagine that that boom went off at the center at, at a point, more or less it is a point from that distance, it's going to radi radiate out in all directions unless blocked by the ground in a sphere. And we know from the surface of a sphere that every time you increase the radius, every time you double it, the surface increases by four. So the energy, we're now talking about energy, uh, intensity actually, technically, is distributed into four. So every, every time you double the distance, the intensity goes down dramatically. Um, it's not just a linear relationship. So your best protection from a... Um, Oh, sorry. What I now need to do is find my little fly speck of a mouse. And go over here and resync my slides. Um, to him. So, so uh, I don't know if anyone's seen this film. It's called The Shout. It's a brilliant film in, uh, set in Cornwall by a Polish director. This is the actor Alan Bates. The, the, the basis of this film, the, the kind of conceit of it, is that this guy can shout so loud he can kill you. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe he's just making it up. So how loud is the human voice in comparison to these other factors? A shout, well, it depends. Some people can yell louder than others, and opera singers can sing louder than we can even talk. But a shout is about 80 decibels at one meter away. So if we apply what we already know... Okay, every time we half the distance, we're going to double the sound pressure, which is six decibels. So if you keep doing that at three centimeters away from your ear, you're at 110 decibels because of this rule, right? So there's safety to be far away from a sound, but the opposite is also true. So you're at a loud concert, and you want to communicate with your friend. You lean over and you yell in their ear. And you're probably more likely to deafen them than the music. Unless it was left field at Brixton Academy in, you know, 1996. And, and this is a serious matter. Like, it might be a reason why you want to take up sign language or, or you know, just come up with a little code for my turn to go to the bar or whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, in summary, then, sound is a longitudinal pressure wave in a medium, it has characteristic wavelength, frequency, amplitude, and so on. So I'm going to move on to hearing, and I'm going to cover this, this section fairly quickly because, of course, when you come to something like anatomy, you can go into it in endless detail. The ear is quite a complex thing, and we generally think of it in three parts because they all, they, each of these three parts of the ear has different functions and you might know some of this already from, from um, second-level biology or what have you. We've got our pinna, which I have a microphone. I have to be careful what I do up here. But um, the, the, the fleshy part, which acts to funnel the sound, but also acts to aid in localization. We can't swivel our ears like some creatures can, but we can move our heads. And we actually do a lot of little involuntary motions that we're not that aware of, even just the little movements and sways I'm doing here as I present. Uh, that aid us in, in localizing sound. Then you have the concha or concha, depending on how you like to pronounce your, your CHs, which, which um, also acts as a bit of an amplifier, but, but, but furthermore, it, it's a resonant cavity that emphasizes certain frequencies, around 4 kilohertz. And you've got your, the, the channel leading to the eardrum or the tympanic membrane, as it's called, which takes this pressure wave and converts it to a mechanical vibration through the three bones of the middle ear, which are lovely. I love the names. You know, you got, you got to be the, you got to want to be the person who named them um, Malleus, Incus, and Stapes, which, which is hammer, anvil, and stirrup. You just want to be that person. These three little bones in your middle ear, 
amplify the sound by a factor of 34, which is like kind of amazing. They're doing a pretty good job. And also, they help with hearing protection because if a very loud sound comes in, there's a couple muscles that tighten, prevent the bones from vibrating quite so much, and cut down on the amplification factor, which, which is sometimes it's one of the reasons why your ears might ring or sounds might appear muffled for a few hours after a loud um, gig. But moving on to the inner ear, uh, there's actually two completely different functions. In the inner ear, the semicircular canals, which look after our balance, and the cochlea, this snail-like spiral, which is where the hearing actually takes place. Whoops, there. It looks like this. It's filled with a blue fluid. No, it's filled with a fluid, which is just blue in this diagram. And it curls around two and a half times, so this is simplified. And so the, the fluid basically curls all the way to the, the tip, the apex, the whatever it's called, helicotrema, and then, it, and then it goes all the way back on the other side as well. So, so sound out here in the air, this mechanical disturbance, pressure, longitudinal pressure waves, hits the eardrum, is converted to mechanical vibrations through three bones, hits the oval window, and then that pushes against the fluid, and so it's converted to a, a wave in the fluid in our ear. So kind of interesting. It goes through all these different stages. Seems unnecessarily complex, but such is evolution. Um, it doesn't take the simplest path. It just takes whatever path it can. And in the, in the center, the, the, there's this vascular membrane and all sorts of stuff, the organ of Corti and uh, science fiction-like um, things, um, in which are little hair cells. So that's a, a, an electron micrograph of a rat uh, cochlea showing how the stereocilia, these little hair cells, are arranged in nice little stair-step rows. And these are the actual cells that convert the vibration that, that they're put under into electrochemical impulses in our uh, nerves. Um, yeah, and we, we, they're very tiny, and we have 3,500 of them. That's it. Um, after that, okay, well, we, you know, when we think about the organs, we go, oh, yeah, the organ does all this stuff, and then the brain processes the information. That is, like, so wrong. I mean, I mean, we should try and get rid of those ideas. I mean, you still see science reports, oh, we found a new part of the brain that does this. It's like, it doesn't really work that way. There's, there, in auditory processing, there's all of these different parts of the chain, all of these different nerve bundles, and um, uh, one of which is called the olive, the superior olive. Um, and all sorts of processing happens before the signal ever gets to the auditory cortex. What's more amazing, or well, it is to me, I guess I'm amazed by everything, but is there's a whole other side not shown here. There's all these efferent nerves that go back to the ear from different higher stages, sending signals back to the ear to use for feedback mechanisms and other ways of, of honing the sound that's received. In fact, the number of stereocilia used for that way outnumber the number that are actually used for hearing, like the actual input hearing. It's very complicated. We don't know a lot about it, but we have got to the point where they can implant uh, you know, mechanical cochlea for people with hearing um, disabilities and so on. Point I want to make. 3,500 hair cells do all our hearing for us. Okay, we have millions of photoreceptors in our eyes. We have millions of receptors for taste, touch, heat, pressure, smell. We have 3,500 for hearing. And we can hear all the stuff that we can hear over this enormous frequency and pressure bands. Um, all of those are there at 10 weeks. Okay? Our cochlea is entirely developed in the womb at 10 weeks. So hearing is our first sense that we have, and it's the first one that we start to lose because hair cells can only die. They can never be fixed, unfortunately, which, which is why hearing protection is so important. I keep coming back to that somehow, don't I? Um, in fact, it is said that, that after your 20s, for every decade, you lose an octave off the top of your hearing. Worse for men than women, um, uh, which is why, you know, grandpa sometimes doesn't know what grandma is saying 
or pretends not to. It's hard to tell at, some, at a certain stage. But OK, so that, to keep moving on, though, um, actually, I'm not 100% sure where we're at. I think we're more or less on schedule. The third main section I want to talk about was psychoacoustics. And we're already starting to get into psychoacoustics, um, which is about our perception and how our perception differs from what we might otherwise call object objective reality. And this can be illustrated through illusions and mistaken impressions that we have about sound. So we compare what we hear or think we hear to what our instruments tell us, and they differ, and we wonder why. Um, I have a listening experiment for you. And I'm gonna, I want to make sure this is comfortable, OK? So I'm going to start it at a lower volume. I might need to put it up a little bit. I'll, I'll see. But, so I'm going to play a sine wave at 400 hertz. So I talked about frequency. I didn't really give you any examples of frequencies and what the numbers mean. I'll play you a pure sine wave at 400 hertz. Then it's going to jump by 5 hertz. So it's going to jump to 405. And just as you listen, see if you can hear the change. OK, that was probably apparent. Uh, that was probably pretty clear. OK, now it's going to change by just 2 hertz, so 400 to 402. Did anyone have trouble hearing that? Everyone heard that just fine. We could keep going, one hertz less, we could just do this. It would help if we were in an anechoic chamber so there are no other disturbances. This is, how, this is how these things are tested. No problem. We can discriminate frequency very finely. OK, in the second test, I'm going to play a constant frequency of 400 hertz. And then simultaneously, I'm going to add the second tone. So instead of alternating, I'm going to play 400 and then together 401. And then I'm going to increment up. So then you'll hear 400 with 402 hertz, 400 with 403, and so on, OK? So whoops, and I'm going to start at the beginning. Jeez, that would help. I wonder how that got there. So that's 400 and 405 hertz played together. Does anyone hear two pitches, two frequencies? Yes? OK. Most people are non-committal or shaking their heads. No, they don't. You hear a volume change, an amplitude change. Yes. But you probably don't hear, although everyone is different, you probably don't hear two frequencies. OK, I'm going to keep going with this. So it would be 400 with 410. 400 with 420, and so on. OK, by the end, you could probably hear it as two frequencies, right? I hope so, because that was 400 and 440. You should definitely be able to hear a difference of 40 hertz as two distinct frequencies. In fact, this is sort of what happens. There is an interval, and, and these numbers are not absolute, by the way. Obviously, they differ for different people. They differ depending on our starting frequency. But there's an interval at which we hear what's called beating, this volume fluctuation. But we do not hear two distinct frequencies. They are there. They're there. We don't hear them. We can't. Even though we could easily hear the difference between 400 and 401 hertz, not when they're played together. Uh, then there's an area of roughness, which is a bit disturbing. And you have kind of like, stop that. Would Robin ever, you know. And then we hear two distinct frequencies. So why does this happen? It happens for everybody in a similar way, except one gentleman. But, but it happens, um, well, first of all, th this has a lot of impact on our music and aesthetics. In musical language, we talk about consonants and dissonance. 
which is about different intervals and how they react together to form roughness or pleasing sounds, which I'll look at when we get to musical instruments, uh, which I need to do really quickly. But why this happens is because of how the frequencies are detected along that basilar membrane in our cochlea. Okay? Higher frequencies are detected at the beginning of the basilar membrane and lower frequencies towards the end. And they're spread out in this fashion with these critical bands, as they're called. So it's not that one precise cell detects, a hair cell detects one precise frequency. It's bands of hearing. So when you get two frequencies played one after the other, there's no problem with that because the peak will be detected as, boom, it's that frequency. But if you have two, you, know, you can imagine them closer together than that, right? If you have two closer together, they're overlapping. The same part of your ear is being asked to do two things at once, and it can't. So that's a simple explanation. It's more complicated than that. But, but um, it's because these critical bands, because we only have 3,500 hair cells doing all this, and we can hear from 20 to 20,000 hertz. That's not even one hair cell for every hertz, right? It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't really work that way, but even just looking at it in that sort of common sense approach, it's just not enough <laughs> to do all the hearing we can do. So, um, yeah. Now, in real life, of course, we're usually not asked to listen to sign tones, <laughs> unless you're in, you know, audio technology class or part of some devious experiment. Um, we usually listen to complex sounds that have more than one frequency, and we would call that complex of sounds the timbre, say, of an instrument. But your ear is still doing all this differentiation or not being able to do this differentiation, as I illustrated. So, so we get into very interesting questions, like how can we tell the same pitch as being played by different instruments? If we look at different instruments on a spectrogram to show us the energy distribution, here I have four different instruments top to bottom, um, we can see they look quite different. So we've got frequency is the vertical axis, time is unwound on the x-axis, and the colors represent how strong the frequencies are. So white is the strongest, brightest, down to cold blue, which is the least energy. So, so for example, the top one we hear is a piano. Okay. Uh, the next one is a violin. These are the actual spectrograms of the actual sounds I'm playing, by the way, so in case that is, aids at all. The third one is a flute. I haven't fully normalized the volumes, but they're more or less the same. And the last one's a French horn. So we can easily tell, despite the completely different timbres of these instruments, that they're all playing the same note. It's actually an A3. Unless you have perfect pitch, you don't know which note, but you can hear they're playing the same note. And if they were played together, it would sound harmonious. This is because of the fundamental frequency of those timbre, timbres. The fundamental frequency, the lowest uh, frequency, is what gives us a very clear sense of pitch. And our ear is very much oriented towards distinguishing that fundamental frequency. Okay, further partials or harmonics might be distinguished um, if they're far enough apart to be outside the critical band, right? Otherwise, we're not going to hear them as different pitches. So that those big spectrograms of sound, we hear far less than that, which is why we have MP3 encoding, but that's another subject. Um, so pitch perception then, harmonics those partials that are integer related to the fundamental, we are really oriented towards hearing. Uh, our ear is built that way. It, it's to such an extent that if you have the full spectrum and you take away the fundamental, you will still hear it often. It's not there in the sound, but you actually hear it because your ear recreates it from the rest of the spectra. And this is why you can listen to music on a crappy computer laptop speaker, and it still sounds good. It's because if you know the music especially, you're filling in all the bits that are missing and actually technically aren't there to be heard. You can test this uh, by miking it up, and you can record like with a really good system so you know that you're not adding any, any degradation with the microphone. You can record that sound 
play back the recording, and it might not sound the same to you that the original did. There's, lots of, there's a lot of weird things that go on in our hearing. Uh, the missing fundamental effect is, is, um, is one of them. And it also illustrates that the theory I showed you about how the basilar membrane picks up frequencies at different points is not the whole story. It can't be, because it doesn't explain the fact we can hear the fundamental even if there's no energy there. There's something else going on, which I'm not going to get into, but um, it's just hearing is a lot more complicated than I'm making out. Okay, so that was frequency perception, loudness perception. What is loudness? All we can say about it, this is the definition of loudness. This is the most pointless definition. Loudness is that attribute of auditory sensation that enables us to order sounds on a scale from quiet to loud. <laughs> That's actually what loudness is because it doesn't correspond to much else in the physical world. It's a completely relative scale. And here is the classic diagram that illustrates that. Ignore the blue, that's a different set of curves, but the red curves are the standard ISO curves as of a certain date, 2003, I think. Okay, what this shows us, every red line is a line that we hear is equally loud. So take the bottom line, our threshold of hearing. At 10 hertz on the x-axis, that has to be 70 dBs loud for us to hear it at all. Whereas if you go over to 1,000, 1 kilohertz, it's just a bit above zero. It's even below zero there at around 3 to 4 kilohertz. It's actually below zero. It sounds the same loudness. So in other words, loudness depends entirely on frequency, but they're supposed to be independent quantities. Okay, in the physics of sound they are. Amplitude and frequency are independent. But in our hearing, they are closely knit together in this fashion. Um, yeah. Um, and, and the reason, okay, sorry, I'll go back to, uh, whoops, go back to this one. The reason it's a lot easier to hear in that region of 1 to 8K, but definitely 3 to 4K, is the same thing I alluded to before. That is how we distinguish speech. So our entire auditory system has evolved alongside our speaking. And so we hear most clearly the spoken word. Um, I mentioned that the conca boosts at 4 kilohertz, but there's lots of other stuff in perception in the whole hearing system that including how we localize that aids in hearing speech. Um, it's why we can clearly hear someone speak across a crowded room, whereas if they weren't speaking, if it was some other sound you tried to hear over the same hubbub of, of noise, you would have no chance at all. It's also because we can perceptually sort of focus, in quotes, on particular sounds, um, and we even use vision to help with that, and this, this thing called the cocktail party effect. But nonetheless, uh, speech and hearing evolved together. So psychoacoustics then, what we know is frequency is not pitch. Okay? I played to you two frequencies together and you just couldn't hear them. No one, none of us could. Well, okay, almost none of us could. So frequency is the basis of pitch, but it does, is not the whole story. Amplitude is not loudness either. And timbre is a complicated appreciation of a sound that has to take both of those things into account and also depend on the spectral envelope, so how the spectra changes over time. So the bite of a bow at the beginning is additional information to how it sounds later on and so on. And also the amplitude envelope, so when you hit a note on a piano, the long uh, decay curve it has, which actually goes on for seconds and seconds, 20, 30 seconds perhaps, that has a lot to do with the sound as well. So we're already talking about the fourth and final part of the, of the talk here, thank goodness, um, which is instruments. Um, and once again, I'm going to start with the definition. So what is a musical instrument? If we had more time, if we had two hours instead of one, I, I, we, could, we could have a discussion on this. But after, after, after doing this for years and years in different, different uh, courses and so on, the, about the only thing you can say in the modern or even postmodern or hypermodern or whatever we're living in now, in the 21st century, a musical instrument is a tool for the purposeful creation of music. So many of the interesting apparatus, apparati around in this, in this exhibit could well be called musical instruments. 
I, most of us don't have a problem with that. 50 years ago, people had a problem with that. Certainly 100 years ago, when innovative instruments were being introduced in the first part of the 20th century, people had a big problem with it. That's not music, that's not an instrument. You know, when synthesizers first came out, you know, Queen put no synthesizers on our albums. You know, they would have that stamped on the album. It was a big problem. Real drummers don't use drum machines, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, uh, so that said, so we're not really going to define a musical instrument then, but we can talk about uh, types of musical instruments and how they produce sound. So we can just take a real functional approach, which is the one taken by Hornbostel Sacht. In, I can't even say that. In 1914, they were the first ones to come up with this way of categorizing instruments into these five categories I'm going to show you. That is if you ignore the fact that 200 years BCE in India, there was a text that did the same thing. But let's just say that in Western Europe, we came up with this. So we have idiot pho idiophones, <laughs> not idiophone, not an idiot. Uh, anyway, an idiophone, membranophone, cordophone, aerophone, electrophone. Most of those are evident from the name, phone just meaning sound. Um, although, yeah. An idiophone, oh, I didn't bring it. I was, I was going to bring some instruments, but I didn't. Um, an, an idiophone is something like, um, like uh, the thumb piano illustrated there, or a xylophone. It's any instrument where the primary substance of the instrument vibrates. So um, it covers things with tines and things that you hit with mallets and that sort of thing. There's a separate category, though, for a membranophone, which is where a stretched membrane vibrates. Now, that is actually part of the instrument, so in some way this is a subcategory, but it's considered a separate category. So any sort of drum that we're familiar with would be a membrane-type instrument. Chord, it means string, by the way. It also, I know it also means three or more notes played together at the same time, but in this case, a chordophone is just the instrument where a string vibrates. An aerophone is when a column of air vibrates, so all of our wind and brass instruments. And finally, later on, not in 1914, but later on in the 50s, I think, they added another category to, to take account of uh, Clara Rockmore and the theremin and things like that, uh, electrophones, which is kind of like, okay, you can also produce sound electrically, so we better have a category for all of that. Now, in each of these cases, you can build a model of an instrument uh, built of four parts. So... Again, if, if you get to go on the, the exhibit uh, after this talk, and I hope you do, because you might have some new insights, ask yourself how the instrument is making sound. Um, there is always an exciter, an energy input into the system. There is a resonator, a part of the instrument which emphasizes certain frequencies. There is an amplifier, a part of the instrument that in increases the amplitude. Otherwise, most acoustic instruments would only be heard by the player themselves. And there's always some sort of filter or something that's changing and modifying the timbre. Sometimes there's more than one of these, um, but, but there's always these four parts, and you can build up models of instruments this way. So I'm going to briefly talk about how we would model this, and very briefly, just looking at a string instrument. A string instrument has a, a string vibrating between two fixed points. That's, that's all you can say about it. It's got to be fixed to either end. The string's not wobbling around. It wouldn't make any good sound if it wasn't under some sort of tension. So in order to figure out, in terms of physics, what wave is actually present on that string, it's very simple. You just draw it. You fix at either end. The lines are fixed points. They're constraints where the string is not allowed to move. If it's not allowed to move there, there can be no energy there. So the wave has to have a zero point there, which we call a node. That is the simplest wave I can draw that meets those constraints, half a wavelength from one end to the other. And if I keep doing that, working from the bottom up, the next simplest one I can draw, the next and the next. That tells you how many wavelengths there are in that distance. And if you also know the speed of sound in that substance, if it's wound uh, string or cat gut or whatever it is, you can work out everything you need to know about the frequencies of that instrument. It's not really... Uh, physics of instruments is actually quite straightforward, but very complex at the same time. The, the core is straightforward. You can do similar with wind instruments, but you have to take into account that if it's an open end, 
instead of a null point there, it's going to have a maximum there, but then you can start drawing all the possible waveforms without even looking at an equation. I'm not going to do that, though. I'm, I'm just going to skip forward here. Now, Pythagoras discovered all this a long time ago. He discovered all this stuff about harmonics and integer relationships of music using the monochord, which is just a single string instrument. And he discovered that pleasing musical intervals occur in simple ratios that are also found throughout nature. So he made of this a universal principle. And he decided that different musical scales and intervals were associated with different types of people and their spirits, their essences, their moods, how preferential they were to society, and so on. Um, and so he developed a whole ethos out of this that went as far as this model, which is a monochord that extends from earth to heaven, and using the pleasing ratios, divides up the entire universe into orbs and realms. Um, and we can laugh at this, but it's interesting. I mean, the number of times I have stuff that like, finds me on Facebook where someone has come up with a new mystical theory of music based on some mathematical relationship with petals on a leaf or something. It's like, yes, well, of course, it's true. Because simple mathematical formulas are behind all of this. And we will find them in many places. It's, it's not mystic, mystical, it's just, it's just the wonder of nature. If you draw a bunch of harmonic waves over top of each other, you get very beautiful patterns, of which this is only one. Um, and, and if you look in terms of music, which I'm not going to spend much time on, but if you look in terms of music, in terms of the intervals we use in our own scale, which has 12 equal divisions of an octave, more or less equal, depending on your tuning system, um, then you will find all of these pleasing intervals. So the most pleasing is two notes with exactly the same frequency played together. That's one-to-one -one ratio. An octave is a two-to-one ratio. A perfect fifth is three-to-two. So as the ratios become more complex, the consonance diminishes. And it sounds more dissonant until you get to things like the, the, the tritone, which is like you know, the devil's interval, like the worst possible sounding thing in, in this crazy system we invented one day. Um, so the point here is the point about the simple ratios. So now I'm going to go back to something I showed you before. I'm going to show you how we perceive frequency based on simple ratios octaves, which is just a two to one ratio. So based on that, and I'm starting with, okay, it's not, okay, E0, well, first of all, E0 is not on the piano, unless you've got a big piano. Pianos don't actually go quite that low, uh, unless you have an extended piano. An organ, an organ, a pipe organ has an E0. It's, it's actually not 20 hertz, it's 20.6, but I rounded off to 20 because people say our hearing starts at 20 hertz. So that's approximately E0. You go up an octave to E1, you double the frequency to 40, E2 is 80, and so on. So you can count all the way up, and you run out of E's, actually, because keyboards don't go that high. Because that's the fundamental frequency, right? And E8 has a fundamental frequency already at 5,000 hertz. I mean, that's so high, it's, it's ridiculous. It sounds like a little pink, is all it sounds like. So we have 10 octaves of hearing in terms of frequency. All right, that's kind of interesting to measure it that way. The scale I used before was exponential base 10, but it actually makes more sense to do it base two, like all our digital computers. We're actually more digital than we realize. I have a whole other talk about that. Um, you can do the same with loudness, or at least I can, <laughs> and you can look at the slide. And I don't know if it makes any sense, but I, uh, here I have loudness octaves. So every doubling, Okay, a doubling of pers okay. Before I said a doubling of SPL sound pressure level is six decibels, but that's not how we hear. We hear loudness differently, and we hear so a doubling is about ten decibels. So I've used ten as the baseline, and I'm not going to rationalize that because it would take twenty minutes. So if we start at zero decibels and we double, we go to ten decibels, and we double the loudness again to twenty, all the way up to a hundred. 120, which gives us 12 octaves of loudness. So I think that's a useful way of looking at things, because then it, it ties into this base two mathematics that, that has a lot to do with both harmonic frequencies, how our musical scales are set up, and so on. Okay, so 
th this has been a strange little overview, just hitting a few little highlights. Um, we've looked at what is sound, how do we hear sound, how do we interpret or perceive sound, which I hope I've demonstrated is quite different, and a little bit about instruments and music and these harmonic relationships, just to tie in with, the, with, with, with what we have here. There's a lot more to learn. Echo, reverberation, interior sound in a room is very different than the ideals I've shown you. How we localize and how sound is spatialized, all about audio recording and reproduction. So, you know, we have a short Q&A session, though. We could cover some of those. But I, but I, but I want to end by um, summarizing a few things that we have learned, what we now know that maybe we didn't know before, and then I'm going to give you one last little thing to listen to. And I'm sorry I've gone over uh, time a little bit. Uh, so we should now know how... Whoops. Where are we? Down. How to identify a note, no matter what instrument it's played on. Uh, why animals might sense an earthquake before we do. Okay, we actually now know why. Why we don't see any dolphins at techno gigs. How olives aid our hearing. How sign language could save your hearing. And why, if you're a musician, you should consider making music for ferrets. Okay, I always try to picture the ideal listener for me is a ferret. And no offense. Um, okay, so I'd like to leave you with a sound. This is a very special sound. Uh, this took many years of constant effort to gather this sound, and I would like to thank Simon Elliott for allowing me to play this. Right, so in the background, there's, there's this outdoor forest sound, but it's that rapid thrumming in the foreground that is the heartbeat of a Eurasian sparrow hawk, uh, recorded in 1991, actually. And in order to make this recording, Simon had to climb 10 meters up a Sitka spruce tree in the pouring rain in Northumberland, and he ran 100 meters of cable back to his recorder. And, and some of his recordings he spent four years getting. This is perhaps not one of them. But anyway, I'd like to end on that. And we will then go to a Q&A uh, session. And what's going to happen is th there's a microphone that will come around the room. So if you have a question about anything I've, I've said or not said, <laughs> so, so that's pretty well anything, isn't it? Then, then, <laughs> then you know, ask to be called upon and wait till you get the microphone and we'll go from there. So I'd like to thank you for your time and, and thank the Science Gallery for having me tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, and then there. Okay, we'll, we'll start over here. Hi, um, is that on? Yeah, it is. Uh, thanks very much. That was fascinating. Uh, I just have a question on like the when you go below what you can hear, right? Like twenty hertz. Yeah. Um, do you know a thing called the Schumann resonance? I think it's called. It's like seven point eight three hertz or something. Oh yes. That's are you? You're, you're probably familiar with that, I assume. It's like the, the resonance at the core of the earth or something like this. And it's, how would you experience that if you can't hear it? Like, is there any empirical studies on how resonance that is below your audible yeah. level can, can impact or affect you, you know? So I, that is an excellent question. Um, thank you. I'm not just saying that. that. That is a really good question. We don't just hear with our ear. In fact, I hate doing presentations where I just show you a diagram of the ear and show you all these parts. I mean, anyone that's ever been to a gig knows that. I mean, like, like drum and bass. Who goes to a drum and bass gig with their ears? You, you, you go for the trouser flapping like bass, right? You go, you, uh, you, you go because the sound has a physical impact on your body. A lot of music, like people I know that make noise music and so on, it's all about stuff like that. It's not about 
It's, it's, it's not about frequencies and amplitudes so much that I've talked about. So we hear with our skin, uh, definitely, because it's vibration. We can sense that. We, we hear with, uh, through bone conduction in the head, which is why certain people, it depends why you're deaf, but certain people who are deaf can hear sound. Their ear could not function, but they can still hear sound to a degree. You can hear through bone conduction. Um, some whales actually do a lot of hearing through bone conduction. They've recently discovered. Um, so it's not all about the ear. So yes, you can hear lots of other sounds. And when you get into the low frequency sounds, if they can have a lot of energy. So they have way more energy in them, actually. And so it's relatively easy for them to hear that through other parts of the body. Now, this thing about resonance is a different thing. And I'd have to know precisely which theory of that you're referring to. There are quite a few theories that have no scientific basis about how the body resonates at different... You know, there's all various mystical theories that go back to Pythagoras. The body as a whole does not resonate, or it would fall apart if it was subject to a sound of that frequency. Because a, a, a resonate means to highly accentuate in that one mode, not node, but mode. So a troop of mil military officers are on parade, and if they go across a bridge, they break step. Because if they were to keep stepping and put all that energy into the bridge, and they happen to hit a resonant frequency, the bridge could collapse. It has happened in history. So you do not want things to resonate, unless you're making a musical instrument. But you don't want things you know, around you to resonate. Uh, and you certainly don't want your own body to resonate. Um, it would, it, you know, because it, the energy would be multiplied, and it could be extraordinarily dangerous. So that's one way to look at it. But there's more to talk about there, I know. But there's a question over this side. Hi, yeah. My question is, is you, you made this point at one point in the talk about, I mean, the frequency range of the, what we can hear is quite small compared to the visual range that we work with, right? Ah. And so, so I mean, we, we all now get these, you know, 4K big screens with megabits and megabits per second of information streamed onto them. Uh, but we don't need far fewer sound bits to do, to transmit faithful sound, right? So sound requires, in terms of information, much less information per second to convey. So here's, and this is something that's always puzzled me, and this is getting into perception and psychology, is... We are able to produce these images on screens, some of which are quite bad, like cartoon images, which we look at and we're quite happy to accept them in the movie or these generated images, which take an awful lot of information to produce. But I've yet to hear an artificially synthesized voice that sounds real. So yes. what is the problem? It, shouldn't be, it should be much easier to synthesize a voice properly, if you think just purely in terms of the information, than to synthesize an image. But why can't we do it? Wow, okay, you, you've hit upon at least four different things I could talk about there. Um, first of all, just briefly address the voice. I mean, I already pointed out, like, our entire hearing apparatus is really oriented to hearing voice. So it's the hardest thing to fake. I mean, we, there are certain musical instruments that are extraordinarily hard to fake as well. Uh, but those tend to be what, like the saxophone, but that's because it actually comes from the voice. Like, instruments that actually have a lot of vocal character are also very hard. Whereas in this day and age, we can pretty well synthesize most instruments indistinguishably pretty well. Um, debate there, of course, much debate there. But the voice is extraordinarily hard. Okay, comparing to visual is always, re the visual realm is always extraordinarily hard because it depends what you mean um, and on what scale you're looking at it. We are extremely poor at seeing electromagnetic spectra, in fact extraordinarily poor. We have terrible vision. Expressed in terms of octaves, we have less than one octave of, of vis vision of the electromagnetic spectra, okay? If you were to do the same analysis. I forget what the numbers are, but we see, in, in fact, in, in, in terms of light, we, we usually express it in terms of wavelength, right? We say we see this nanometer of light, which represents this color. So it's the inverse of frequency, but it's up in the terahertz of of frequencies, how fast it's vibrating. But we see less than one octave out of this enormous electromagnetic spectra that includes radio, x-rays, 
all light, like, but all electromagnetic spectra. So actually, we're very bad at seeing electromagnetic spectra. We're much better at hearing sound in that, in that measure. By that measure, I've just given. Much better. Because we can go all the way down to 20 hertz. Well, there's not much left, right? There's only 20 <laughs> cycles per second left. I mean, there's a whole world left, really, that, that certain whales probably hear and we don't. But um, so, so it depends on the measure you're using. But also, also the, 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 the two senses are similar in no possible way because the, the sensors in the eye all sense across the whole spectrum, more or less. Some are more or less tuned to some than others, but it's more or less a grid of overlapping sensors, whereas in the ear, it's actually quite linear on the basilar membrane from frequencies, you know, um, from high frequencies at the onset to as you extend out to the wider, floppier end of the basilar membrane at the end of the snail where we hear the bass. So it's actually linear. Um, so the, uh, they're, they're very, very different. What, that, okay, that touches only two of the four things. <laughs> and so maybe, maybe I should leave it there. But I mean, it's just, we also live in a visual culture that's been that way since, well, for a long time, at least since, Alberti in the Renaissance, who developed perspective theory that dictates how we look at images. Um, you have to learn how to read a photograph. You're not born knowing what's on a photograph. We've naturalized it. We don't realize that anymore. But it, it, you know, it's hard to do this now, but in the 1970s, when you could still go somewhere on the earth where there was a different culture that had never seen a photograph, you took someone's photograph, you showed it to them, they had no idea what was on it. They could not recognize it was even a human figure because they'd never had to look at a square sheet and, and interpret the perspective. I mean, they just look at the world around them. So we've learned all of that. And we've not just learned it through our own lives, but our whole culture has... All of our philosophies based on visual metaphors, all of it, uh, all Western philosophy, all... all um, uh, most of our language is all visual. I see what you mean, you know? It's like, so, so it's very hard to compare because un, un, until the last 30 or 40 years, there hasn't been a concerted effort to develop a philosophy of sound or, or a language of sound. Uh, it's definitely happening, and there's lots out there to read about it in the last 10, 20 years, lots of, lots of, lots of cool stuff. As a sound artist, it's fascinating. Um, and this exhibit is, is uh, 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 symptomatic of that amazing progress, you know, that people are quite happy to play with a lot of cool musical things and not worry about, is this an instrument, is it right to do this, or, you know, all these sorts of questions have faded away a bit, and we're developing new languages for it. Any other questions? <laughs> this one down here? And, okay. Um, like in a lot of your presentation, you, you kind of uh, talk about the body quite a lot and kind of how, uh, how situated uh, sound is uh, from a, like a, like you sort of like, you sort of tread on a lot of uh, phenomenology basically when you're speaking about what you're doing, uh, what, you're, what, you're, what you're explaining. I was just wondering, is there kind of like a dearth of ways to explore uh, how this works with us like is there is there like because you're actually talking about like uh, old theories that like still speak some kind of truth like that are yeah. hundreds of years old like is there because like if you're looking at like mm, the most popular sort of and more um well-funded areas of science of, of of human experience you're a lot of people looking at the brain um but when you talk about sound like it's kind of hard to use that Cartesian split that's so popular in science anymore uh, when you look at sound. So is there a kind of like a kind of a void there to explain properly what you're talking about? I, not anymore. I think the, the, I know what you're saying exactly. So the, so the idea that, that um, OK, maybe I can express it the other way around. Because if, if, we've, if we've been brought up in a visual culture and inculcated in perspective theory in particular, perspective theory puts us at one point optically in relationship to, say, a painting or a TV screen or a movie or whatever. And everything is designed towards that point. And it emphasizes uh, the person as an abstract. But you can't approach sound that way. 
uh, for a lot of reasons. Sound is spatial, first of all. Sound fills a volume in a different way. I mean, light also fills a volume, but we don't perceive it that way. So, you know, it's perceived differently. And so we do need a new vocabulary and a new philosophy for sound. And it highlights a lot of problems with the other flip side is, uh, if you look at things through sound, you highlight a lot of perhaps problems with previous explanatory frameworks. So the mind-body Cartesian split, I mean, probably all of us in this room are well aware of that and how ridiculous it is, but we keep on going on as if it's true, though. I mean, like every day I see another article about this part of the brain does this or this part of whatever does that. Um, it's just not true. Like... In tennis, you're playing tennis with someone. Say you're really good. I mean, better than I am at tennis, much better. Someone serves a ball at you, and you react and you serve it back, hit it back. You don't serve it. You re reply, whatever. It's not a reply either. My tennis vocabulary, slipping, late in the evening. But how did you hit that ball? You had to have seen it, tracked its trajectory, Sent, okay, so all these um, afferent effects, the nerves going to the brain, processing, send that back out to the arm, the muscles, the tendons, and so on to make that happen. Can't happen. Takes too long. The, ner the nerves have finite amounts of time they take to travel. They actually work fairly slowly. Different, work, different nerves work at different velocities in the body. But you can, you can look at it. There's no way it can be done. You react far quicker than is possible. Like, your body knows how to return the ball through what we sometimes call muscle memory and don't think about it. Well, if it's muscle memory, yeah, but that means I could do this faster than my brain could ever think about it. So what part of me is thinking, right? You get in all these... What part of me thought to return that ball, to return the serve? So is thinking even the right word for it? So there are, there are everyday things in our everyday lives, if you play tennis every day, but, but you know... <laughs> Same things apply in other realms uh, that, that contradict this whole idea of a central processing unit with all this stuff. And sound is a really good way of, of getting to that, uh, I think. Um, I mean, there's a talk I've done that's, that's just called Hearing as Science Fiction. And I just, I, I, I emphasize more so than I did today all of these paradoxes and things that can't possibly be true, you know, that we can learn through sound. Stuff that, stuff that can't possibly, you know, our, our understandings that are obviously wrong, but which we, we are often not confronted with the fact they're obviously wrong. So the brain obviously does a lot. But I mean, there, there's also weird, there, there was a special like years ago on the BBC and they showed this schoolboy at the beginning of it, this, those great hour-long specials they used to do before the BBC became what it is now. And uh, this schoolboy with his little cute uniform going to school with his little satchel and all that, and this is Billy. Billy's, you know, maybe he's in Northumberland or something. Uh, anyway, he, he's going to school, and they, know, and, and they show him getting up and getting ready and going out, going to school and sitting in class, and say, Billy has no brain. <laughs> like, what? It's like, it's like, but he's got nothing in his head. His skull's actually hollow. Uh, now, he does have some nervous tissue, but he's got no brain. He doesn't have a corpus callosum. He doesn't have an auditory center. He doesn't have any of these things. He's still a perfectly functioning human being. He's probably out there right now doing, you know, a lawyer or something. <laughs> I couldn't resist, sorry. I couldn't resist that. But, but you know, our understandings are... are, are you can find counterexamples that, that force us to question our understandings of how stuff works. And this and sound, I think, is a particularly good way to... That's what sound, sound artists and sound philosophers are, are definitely starting on that route. I might have answered something. And there was one up here, a woman... Last one, yes. Is there a pub nearby? We could do that, too. You mentioned perfect pitch. Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about it, please? Actually, no. I, I, <laughs> I, I, well, I would like to. I actually don't know much about perfect. I've met people with perfect pitch. I think it must be a horrible affliction. Um, because nothing, you know, since the invention of the tape recorder has ever been at the same pitch. Uh, I, I mean, even before that, it wasn't. So I can talk about that. I mean, an orchestra, what does an orchestra tune to when all the instruments tune? They, they tune to a tuning fork. It's an A. 
usually 440 hertz, people say. It's A440, it's called, they tune to. Except they don't. Orchestras all over the world tune to different frequencies. Orchestras in different cities in Germany tune to different frequencies. Uh, so if you go from concert to concert and you have perfect pitch, you're going to be really upset. <laughs> so I think it's got to be very complicated. I don't think it is actually... I mean, I have not studied it or even read much on it, so that's why I'm, I can't speak to the question, except that I think it's more complicated than just knowing absolute frequencies. I mean, it's called perfect pitch and not perfect frequency, which is interesting to me because I don't think... Uh, I don't think it's a matter of knowing a perfect frequency. I think it's probably a matter that once these people are in a particular milieu, so once they're at that concert and they know what the tuning is and their brain or ear or body has processed it, then anything outside of that disturbs them a lot more and they can tell exactly how much it's off by. So maybe it's more, maybe it's more about discrimination of frequency from a norm because otherwise, as I say, I mean, like you listen to one record and the next. I mean, even song, subsequent songs on the same record in pop and rock music are not tuned the same. Good engineers and producers try to tune them the same, but, but there's not that many good old-fashioned engineers that would do that anymore. So, um, so yeah, it must, be, it must be hell. Has anyone here got perfect pitch? There's got to be someone in a room this size. Yeah? Is it hell? <laughs> How, how does it, could you, could you talk about it? Like how it, like subjectively, like how it functions for you? Well, usually, uh, as you said, you're differentiating from norm. So a, a lot of the time, the norm of that would be the 440 uh, A. Right. And um, if something is off tune for that, it's very easy to come home. So if you were to go to a different hall where a different group was playing at A432, would the whole thing bother you? No, because you just kind of adjust. You adjust, yeah. So it's not actually an absolute frequency thing. Well, like through your whole life, it's not like the same. It's not like you could always tell. Uh, no. So yeah, see, that's what I, I mean. I've talked to a couple other people just casually like this, and that and that and that. Seem, I've not studied it or even read up on it. So it's, interesting. so it's more a relative thing. So it's just like some part of your processing is just way better than the rest of us at discerning. So what about those sine wave tests? Did you hear this pretty well the same as I was explaining or different? Not the same. Right, so it didn't affect that. And could you tell it was 400 hertz? Probably not, actually. 440, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Is that a wrap, I think? Yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Good stuff. Right, so if you want, I mean, my email is just my, my website is my name, dot com, and my email is just robin at robinparmer.com. So, you know, I don't have business cards. It's the 21st century. So, but feel free to email me if you have other follow-on questions.